My name is Jia. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard University. Uh, today is my great pleasure and thanks for the invitation from APOC Foundation to introduce to you my research topic about the building the soft and flexible brain machine interface. So the my lab at Harvard are interested in how the neural functions give rise to the behavior, or how the malfunction of those neurons give rise to the disease. Specifically, we want to build those uh, uh, high performance brain machine interface to collect those uh, neural activity to control the external robotics or neural prosthetics, or apply it as a bioelectronic therapeutics to ameliorate those uh, neurological disorders such as uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. And then in the future, we envision that the brain machine interface could be the enabling technology that allows the nature and the machine intelligence integration for the potential human AI symbiosis. And I borrow this slogan from the DAPA that uh, potentially free the mind from our informative body. So before we go to the technology platform, the first we want to discuss what are the challenges that we need to address to build the next generation brain machine interface technology. So the first challenge that is so-called the single cell activity across the entire brain really matters. So unlike our computer chip, the brain, when the brain functions, it recruits activity from the neurons distributed across this entire 3D volume of the brain. So for example, this is a functional MRI imaging of a human patients and those red color label where the brain regions that is uh, functioning. You can see that it really recruits the activity from multiple brain regions distributed across the entire 3D volume of the human brain to define this human patient's brain internal state. And this is another imaging, the calcium imaging of a zebrafish. Each individual dots, the red dots label a neuron that is under firing. You can see that it really recruits this fish. We really need to recruit those neurons across its entire 3D volume of the brain to collectively define this fish's brain behavior state. So if we want to achieve this whole brain wide single cell resolved activity mapping, then we will face the second challenge that is called the spatial temporal dilemma in neural engineering. For each individual neurons, the activity, action potential, operate at a millisecond time scale, confined into, each, confined into the individual neurons at the spatial scale from 10 to 100 micrometer. However, we know that the brain does not operate at a millisecond time scale. It usually takes days, months, or even years to build up the emotions, cognitions, and the memory. And it recruits millions to billions of the neurons at the spatial scale from centimeter to even meters. And consider those large number of the neurons in the brain, we need to provide the bandwidth at least 500 gigabytes to the 2000 terabytes per second to interface with them. Then there is a huge gap between what we can achieve right now to what we want to achieve in the future. But why we think there is an opportunity for us to address those questions at this moment? Because on, on one hand, driven by the Morse law, the number of the transistor on one integrated circuit has already been raised to the number that is equally true or even higher than the number of neurons in a human brain. On the other hand, driven by this progress in nanotechnology, we now can miniaturize the electrical detectors and the stimulators down to the subcellular size, long-term stably interfacing with each individual neurons in the in vitro cultural system. So if we put these two systems here together, on the left, that is the human brain with billions of the neurons. On the right, that is our powerful computer chip, billions of the transistors. What we are missing right now is a cable a scalable interfacing technology to bridge the electrochemical impulses in the each individual neurons to our powerful hardware to decode them. So what are those technology looks like, should be look like? The X and the Y, that is the temporal and the spatial scale. 
And this two dash line label the resolution of this technology that is a single cell and a single spike spatial temporal resolution. And for traditional microelectronics based bioelectronics, they can easily achieve the single cell, single spike spatial temporal resolution, but they cannot last for a very long time in the biological brain. They cannot be distributed across the entire 3D volume of the brain. So if we have this very powerful semiconductor fabrication technology, why not we first just borrow those technology to fabricate the large scale bioelectronics interfacing with the millions to billions of the neurons. So there is a, have already have those technology pursuing this direction. The technology named the NeuroPixel. It is a CMOS driven the multiplexed electrode array fabricated by those uh, semiconductor fabrication uh, pipelines. We can integrate uh, thousands of the electrodes onto one brain probe and collect thousands of the neural activity from the biological brain. However, the signal is not very stable. Over a couple of weeks or months, you will lose the activity that you can collect from those neurons. So in the first part of my talk, I want to discuss you, with you about the tissue-like electronics that we are developing, providing this long-term stable brain-machine interface at the single cell level. So first, uh, we need to understand what is the limitation, what is the limiting factor prevent us from long-term stably record the neural activity from the brain. So it's actually coming from this size and mechanical mismatch between the brain and the electronics. If you have a chance to see a biological brain, it is very soft, like a tofu or pudding. But electronics is very rigid, like a blade. So put the electronics into the brain, it's like put a blade into a tofu. Any small movement of the brain can cause the electronics to cut the brain at the micrometer scale, introduce this long-term damage to the brain, and causing the drift of the probe inside the brain so that you cannot long-term stably record the activity from the same neuron. In addition, it will trigger the huge immune response, the foreign body effect from the brain to the implanted brain probe. So that over the time, there is a significant degradation of the neurons and the proliferation of immune cells at the brain-machine interface so that you will lose those, each, those individual neurons action potential that you can record it in the very beginning. And for the patients with a deep brain stimulator implanted, every couple of months or a year, you need to relocate the stimulator location to find the healthy neuron for the stimulation. So in the first part of my research, that we are thinking that can we design the electronics that eliminate the immune response and the neural deaths from the implantation to provide this long-term stable electrical interface at a single cell level to the neurons. Then we look at the history. Is there any material system that a human has been ever developed that can bypass this immune response and the mechanical and the size mismatch with the biological system? Actually, we do have this material system. It named the synthetic tissue scaffold which is a three-dimensional micro-porous soft biomaterial. It can allow the cell grow into them. And once they transplant back to the human body, it will not trigger this uh, chronic immune response in the biological system. So we are trying to build those electronics to mimic their structure. Also have this uh, 3D micro-porous structure, subcellular feature size, tissue level mechanical property. And most importantly is that this uh, device also needs to be compatible with the state-of-the-art lithographic fabrication technology used in the semiconductor industry so that we still maintain the scalability, leveraging the potentials in the semiconductor fabrication industry to integrate thousands to millions of the sensors together into those electronics network to interface with the brain. But actually in the very beginning, we cannot even build the electronics to fully mimic the soft 
mechanical property of the brain. Because for all those electronics material used for the nanofabrication, it have the intrinsic Young's modulus at least six orders of magnitude higher than the Young's modulus of the biological tissue. And for the materials which have this tissue level softness, they are not compatible with the lithographic fabrication. So in the very beginning, we can only make the tissue level flexible electronics because the flexibility is not only determined by the Young's modulus, but also the thickness of the device so that we can make a very thin electronics to bring those uh, rigid electronics into the tissue level flexible electronics. We can even further design the device to make sure that the bending energy of the electronics is the same as the bending energy of the cell. So that if there's a displacement happen between the electronics and the cell, the cell will not feel the pressure directly from the device. So if we put those things into the consideration, the thickness of the device need to be less than one micrometer, which is already approaching to the limitations of those devices. Because for any electronics, you need to have the enough thick dielectric material, the encapsulation layers, to prevent the current leak from the device to the biological system. Therefore, in the very beginning, we build this like a sub-micrometer thick electronics by simply sandwich a metal layer with a two layer of the plastic dielectric material. And you see that we measure the mechanical property of the device features by using the atomic force microscopy and it shows that it indeed have the cell level mechanical property. So we build those uh, mesh, this extremely flexible mesh like nano electronics that can be directly injected into the brain for the long-term stable interface. And over the year, we have been substantially improving this uh, process. Right now, we can integrate this uh, tissue level flexible mesh like nano electronics with a polymer micro needle. In between, there's a water soluble layer so that we can use the micro needle inject those mesh electronics into the brain after the water soluble layer has been dissolved, withdraw the micro needle to deliver an unfolded mesh electronics into the brain tissue. So this is the brain tissue after several weeks of the implantation of the mesh electronics, which is labeled by the red color. And the green and the purple are neurons and the immune cells. You can see that there's no degradation of the neurons and the proliferation of the immune cells at this flexible mesh electronics brain interface. We keep test this kind of immune response free implantation up to one year and showing that indeed there is no degradation of the neurons and the proliferation of immune cells at the electronics brain interface over one year implantation. And we can collect the electrical signal from multiple brain regions simultaneously. And using this very stable interface, we can collect, we can collect the electrical activity from the same neurons over the entire adult life of animal. For example, in this like a 14 months continuous recording, you can see that the action potential, those each individual spikes that are collected from the neurons has not been changed at all. So that we are not just to provide the stable recording, but the stable recording from the same neuron. And we also do so many statistic tests to make sure that the signal hasn't been changed and continuously recorded from the same neuron. Actually, this uh, solves these fundamental issues in modern brain-machine interface. So due to this uh, probe drifting and the immune response, using the traditional rigid brain probe every day, you are basically recording the different set of the neurons from the brain. So that in, the, in this field, people concentrate on the development of the computational-based stabilizer or brain decoder to realign this uh, change the neural signals from this uh, 
instability at the front end, the signal recording part. And for us, we don't need to do that anymore because we are not showing that we can stably record the activity from the same neuron, but we can stably record the, act the behavior associated neural activity. And then we can use those stable signal as a training data set to train a neural network to build up this animal-specific brain decoder, long-term stably decode the brain state. So in this first part of the talk, I hope I convince you that by building those tissue-like electronics, we can provide this long-term stable brain-machine interface at the single cell level. Then the second question is that how we distribute the sensors, how we distribute a large number of sensors across the entire 3D volume of the brain. And the one direction is that we can implant a large number of the electrode, a large number of the brain probe across the 3D volume of the brain. But inevitably, it will cause this huge damage to the brain tissue. So then come back to, to, to the issue that how we integrate more electrodes, more sensors on one brain probe. And one limitation is that when you have a more electrode integrated on one brain probe, those dielectric layers between the sensors and the interconnects are, are not able to be avoided. So that the device becomes thicker again, and it becomes rigid again. And all those email response probe drifting issues will come back. So real solution is that we use really soft material for this uh, electronics fabrication. However, all the soft material, you can consider them as a cross-link liquid or have a micro-porous structure at room temperature. They are easily swelled by the organic solvent used for the nanofabrication. But for the nanofabrication, you always have a multi-layer structure. So you need to fabricate each layer one by one. And if those materials are sensitive to the organic solvent, the patterns will be easily destroyed. So we need to have the solvent-resistant, chemically orthogonal and photopatternable elastomer for the brain probe fabrication. Secondly, we found that the ions in the biofluids can easily penetrate into those soft material. So over the time, those soft dielectric material become ion conductor they cannot encapsulate the electronics anymore. So we also need to have the long lab elastomer in the physiological condition. So by considering this together, we develop the material that is as stable, the soft material that is as stable as those rigid materials, but as soft as the brain tissue itself. And using those materials, we can fabricate the brain probe with these uh, hundreds of the electrodes fully integrated together, but still maintain the brain level softness. We can implant into the brain, long-term stability track the activity from the same neuron without introducing the significant damage, mechanical damage and the immune response in the brain. And right now we incorporate the company to fully leverage the potential of this technology because this technology can only show its advantage when there's like a thousands to millions of the sensors fully integrated together. We are working with the semiconductor industry companies to also design the multiplexing circuits to boost the number of the sensors that we can integrate into one brain probe and pursue the clinical trial. But that is just one direction that we increase the number of the electrode on one brain probe so that we can implant a very few number of the probe to collect the signal from a large number of neurons. However, when the brain gets mature, the neuron has been, in, has been innovated at the nanometer scale so that no matter how small and how soft you design the probe, as long as you need to implant them into a mature brain, it will cause the inevitable mechanical damage to this uh, matured neural network. So how can we solve that? To non-invasively distribute the sensors across the entire 3D volume of the brain tissue. So it turns out that actually the nature already gave us a solution. This entire 3D brain is actually developing from a two-dimensional cell sheet named the neural plate on the embryo. And over the course of the development, the neural plate will first fold into a neural cube 
and with the further folding and the expansion, grow into a 3D volume of the brain. So if we can design a stretchable mesh electronics and integrate with the stem cell sheet, the nature development can distribute the sensors across the entire 3D volume of the brain. So we first test this idea on the stem cell system because over this time course of stem cell development, the cell start with this two-dimensional cell sheet fold into a 3D structure and ultimately grow into a three-dimensional organoid structure. And we can integrate a stretchable mesh electronics with the two-dimensional stem cell sheet throughout this development, distribute the sensors and stimulators across the entire 3D volume of the tissue. So this is how we build the stretchable mesh electronics. We replace those like straight lines in the mesh electronics into this serpentine-like structure so that they become extremely stretchable. Even this after releasing from the substrate, even the floating of the water can easily stretch, stretch there. Then they can be extremely stable in the solution. And the ones integrated into the st two-dimensional stem cell cell sheet, it can start to fold into the 3D by this tissue development. And after 20 days of development, when the stem cell grow into a 3D organoid structure, it automatically distributes those sensors across the 3D volume of the organoids that we name it as a cyborg organoid. We can induce the organoids into whatever tissue that we want. For example, in this case, we induce the organoids into the cardiac tissue so that we can collect this multiplex electrical activity across the 3D volume of the cardiac organoids. We can even, even stable, stably record the activity over the time course of the cardiac development. Start with this uh, calcium wave-like uh, signal, gradually emerge a hyperpolarization and ultimately generated depolarization. We can also distribute those stretchable mesh electronics into the brain organoids and capture when the action potential first emerged from this brain organoid development. And ultimately we will distribute them into the real living animals. So through this way, by combining the tissue level soft nanoelectronics and the cyborg engineering, we can build the electronics to interface with the brain across its entire 3D volume structure. Okay, so thank you uh, for your attention. I, in the end, I would like to thank my group members, my collaborators, as well as the generous support from the funding agency. Thank you.